Next to her is Joseph Ferrara. Good morning. Next to me on my right is Councilor Robert Juvenville. To, to my left, Councilor Eileen Duff. Seated next to her, Councilor Terry Kennedy. And next to Councilor Kennedy is Councilor Paul DePaolo. And, uh, Mary. and is Ramada and Mary Hurley uh, had some car issues or whatever. She will be on WebEx. I'm just okay. Okay. And what? Ramadan should be, is he, here? where is he? You, okay, he's current. We'll wait till he comes in and then they will, we'll start the uh, commutation hearing. The witnesses. No, no. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Back to you, sir. Good. Good. Morning. At this point, um, representing Mr. Shabazz is attorney Mia Teilbaum. And are we going to hear from you first? Yes. yes. Okay. okay. We'll hear from you and then we'll hear from uh, you witnesses. Wonderful. And Thank you. obviously, Mr. Shabazz. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, counselors, and thank you, Chairman Ayanella. My name is Mia Teitelbaum, and I'm honored to be here today representing Mr. Ramanan Shabazz. We're very grateful to have this opportunity to present his case to you and to address any questions you may have. <clears throat> I first want to thank the Advisory Board of Pardons for honoring Mr. Shabazz with a very thoughtful and moving hearing and for recommending his petition to the governor of Massachusetts. I want to thank Governor Baker and his legal staff for a very careful and thoughtful review of Mr. Shabazz's case. And in conjunction with Mr. Koontz and Mr. Allen, bringing back the remedy of commutation to Massachusetts after so many years. I also want to thank Mr. Allen, Mr. Koontz and their legal teams for paving the way for Mr. Shabazz and providing a tremendous amount of support and guidance during this process. And before we begin, <clears throat> I'd also like to recognize the families of Calvin Thorne and Harry Jeffries. We suffered a tremendous loss over these very many years, a loss which I'm certain caused wounds that may never heal. On a personal note, I'm guided in this life by my faith in the fundamental goodness of humanity and the recognition that no person is the sum of their worst act, I believe is formally recognized by our society in the, in the form of clemency. I know the council's well aware of the importance of clemency to our criminal legal system and has been actively advocating for um, criminal clemency to be utilized more widely in Massachusetts. What is rehabilitation, rehabilitation if not Mr. Shabazz? If clemency enshrined as it is in our legal system is to mean something, then what Mr. Shabazz has done over more than 51 years of incarceration is surely deserving of this extraordinary measure. As you'll hear from the witnesses today, Mr. Shabazz today is not the young man who took the lives of Calvin Thorne and Harry Jeffries. Within a year of his conviction and after six months on death row, he embarked on a path of self-development and self-improvement that continues to this day. His steadfast commitment to bettering himself, a commitment notwithstanding the lack of any motivating source like the possibility of parole, is remarkable. The number of programs he's participated in and led is unparalleled. He has served as a mentor and guide for countless young men who are veering towards a path of risky and violent behavior, back to a place of self-awareness and self-respect through participation in programs like the Reach Out program with DYS youth, providing GED tutoring, and the Companion program. It was Mr. Shabazz's patience, calm demeanor, an ability to see and communicate his respect for the humanity in these men that helped them to learn to care for themselves and to connect with others respectfully. In other words, the effects of Mr. Shabazz's efforts to better himself and to mentor others ripple out, improving not just the specific lives of the individuals he's worked with, but the entire community and society at large. You can see the impact Mr. Shabazz has had on the community by simply taking a look around at the many people here today to support him. One of the letters of support that we submitted includes 284 signatures. It is incredibly difficult to maintain relationships with family members and friends outside of prison walls, 
because of the practical barriers to meaningful communication and contact. Mm -hmm. And yet, over more than 51 years, Mr. Shabazz has built a community that stands by and supports him tirelessly. The strength of these relationships and his community is not just remarkable, it's also indicative of his particular likelihood of success if he's released. Mr. Shabazz appreciates the tremendous responsibility of demonstrating to you that he is worthy of commutation. And he does not shy from that responsibility. He embraces it with grace and humility as he has every challenge he has faced during his more than half century of incarceration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any of the counselors uh, have any questions of uh, <coughs> Ms. Teitelbaum? No questions. Okay. Next, I have you with. <laughs> excuse me. Hmm. I have your witness list, but before I get to your witness, does Mr. Shabab want to make a statement? Does he want to do it now or after the witnesses? I'll leave it up to you. He, he, uh, are you ready to do it now? Sure, we, Absolutely. Yeah. we can do it now. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I know. As you know, my name is Mohamed Shabazz. Hey, speak up just a little, a little, little louder, please. As you know, my name is Mohamed Shabazz. I had a change from James Hall. I want to thank this honorable governor's council for granting me this opportunity to speak to you on my, on my behalf for the work that I've done to be here today. Thank you. I want to express my sincerest, deepest apologies to Mr. Calvin C. Thorne, his family, his mother, Alberta, his daughter, Phyllis, his daughter, Thelma, six brothers and four sisters, his loving friend, Miss Carrie, and other family members and relatives. I want, to, I want to express how truly sorry I am to Mr. Harry T. Jeffries' family, his father, Lemuel, his wife, Nancy, his two children, three brothers, two sisters, and other family members and friends. So, I want to thank our Honorable Governor Charles Baker for making bold steps by setting precedents and making clemency real possibilities of hope for the men and women incarcerated in the great Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Excuse me one second. Anyway, because there's people on WebEx, if you could put this a little closer to you. Okay. It's on. Thank you. Thank, thank you. I'm sorry. I thank the advisory board, board of pardons for recognizing the work that I have done to better myself and give back others to the community and, and recommending my petition for commentation to the governor. On August 14, 1971, I was 21 year old, returning from Vietnam with a drug problem, with PTSD, unbeknown PTSD at the time. I committed a robbery to get money to get more drugs at Freedom Foods Supermarket. I shot and killed Mr. Calvin Thorne. And I'm responsible for my role in the shooting and killing of Mr. Harry T. Jeffries as well. I caused both men's death. I'm the reason why Mr. Thorne and Mr. Jeffries didn't return to their families on August 14, 1971. I caused the pain and grief, hurt and suffering the children experience by losing their fathers and growing up without their fathers. <clears throat> because of my selfish actions, Mr. Thorne and Mr. Jeffries did not attend their children's school and graduation because of me. Because of my selfish and greedy need for drugs, I took away Mr. Thorne and Mr. Jeffries' suggestions, guidance as to which school or career their daughters and sons should follow. Because of my actions, Mr. Thorne and Mr. Jeffries are not present for holidays, birthdays, weddings, 
vacation times were there for him. <clears throat> the other way. That's some of my actions of August 14th, 1971. The only way Mr. Thorne and Mr. Jeffrey's grandchildren can see them is be their grandfather's gravesite in the cemetery. That's me. In my family, we lost a son and nephew to gun violence. His son now would grow up without his father, just like Mr. Thorne and Mr. Jeffrey's children. Knowing that pain and hurt helps me to understand the pains and hurt that I have caused. I am deeply, deeply sorry for causing the deaths so much pain to Mr. Thorne and Mr. Jeffrey's families. I know I can never take back my actions on that day, August 14th, 1971, no matter how much I like to. But today, I try to use my life to make amends and making the world a better place. I tried to do every program available in the DOC facilities where I've been in. Alternative violence, including basic or advanced trainer facilitator with my dear friend and mentor, Ms. Marjorie Stryker, the mother, Christine, wife of Dr. Richard Parker, taught me how to listen to what is being said find a common ground, trust my instincts, and when it's time to act by withdrawing or walking away. Ms. Stryker was also my thesis advisor for my thesis for incarcerated Vietnam veterans for a master's degree. I was involved with Mr. Robert Carsagian's program growing together for nine years, focusing on issues of self-understanding taking responsibilities for offending behaviors, internalization of personal growth and learning and thinking about the experiences of the victim's family and the suffering that I caused. I was chosen by Chaplain Peggy Newman to participate in a newly created, very selective companion program while I was a Cavity worker at Worcester State Hospital for eight years, served as a special need assistance for two mentally ill patients. My focus was to connect and work with these men. They both was very difficult, but my internal self said, I can do this. It took some time, patience, listening skills, coping skills, to show these patients that I am just like you, meaning I've been there too. I also worked at Worcester State Hospital for three and a half years while I was at Lancaster pre-release for five years with 48 furloughs doing community work, living meals with elderly with my wife's church. While on furloughs many times, we returned to, we returned to Freedom Foods to say a prayer to Mr. Thorne and Mr. Jeffries on how sorry I was for stealing their lives from them. I want to thank my family's supporters, Will Allen Second Chance for Justice, Brockton Interfaith Group, have all rallied around me to support me for this opportunity for commentation. I am deeply, deeply sorry from the bottom of my heart for causing both families, Mr. Thorne and Mr. Jeffrey's families, so much pain and grief for my selfishness. I'm truly sorry. Thank you. I look forward for your answer, your questions. Thank you very much. Do any of the counselors uh, have any uh, questions of uh, Mr. Shabazz? Uh, Councilor Robert. Ch One, sir. Good morning. One, sir. So, I take it you're not the same person you were in 1971 when you committed this crime. I changed, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, 1969, you were drafted into the military. Yes, sir. Where did you go for boot camp? Fort Dix, New Jersey. And uh, I did a year in Vietnam. 
Uh, I did one month in Vietnam. And have you been treated at all for PTSD? Over the years, yes. In 1980, when we found out what it was about, I started getting treatment then. I had at least 25 years of PTSD counseling to the different institutions I've been in. I'm in a PTSD group now at Oak Colony. Uh, well, I reviewed the material on you, and I, I think what you did in prison is pretty remarkable. Thank you, sir. I don't know how you did it, to be quite frank, but you did it. I, I go into prisons quite a lot representing people. I don't think I could make it in there like you did. Thank you, and sir. I accept your apology to the family, and I think you mean it. Yes, sir, I do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Joseph Ferreira. Thank you. Um, what do you say to the people in society that say the victims aren't walking around? Why should you be walking around? I tell the people in society that, yes, these two men are not walking around because of me and my selfishness and my drug problem at the time. But I think I can help society out. I have. I've done work in society. Worked at Woodson State Hospital three and a half years. Worked at uh, Bridgewater State Hospital eight years dealing with mentally ill patients. So I helped on Frello, delivering meals. I was in Lancaster. When Lan the river in Lancaster overflowed, they needed bodies to help at Lancaster. I got there making sandbags, delivering sandbags to people's homes and their businesses so they won't get flooded out. In the middle of the night, raining, coming down, snow, ice, everything. Wet like everyone else in the town. And when what was done, the town gave us a nice barbecue during the summertime in the town park. There's no question you've been mostly a model prisoner with you know few exceptions of disciplinary reports. Um, if someone had killed a member of your family, how would you feel about them being released? Everyone deserves a second chance, at least one chance, at least one second chance, especially if they're doing well. And following the rules, obeying the rules, doing the things positive to keep them out of prison. They deserve a second chance. I said I lost a member of our family too to gun violence, and I know one day that person's going to come up. And you'll be there to testify in favor of release? I have to be, because he deserves, he deserves a second chance. Hope. That's all we have in prison is hope. We hope to come this far. To be here, to show the governor, as well as the governor's council and everyone else, that some of us are capable to handle freedom again, to be in society again. How many people, uh, you've been there 50 years, how many people in your situation you think ought to receive a commutation or a pardon? Well, guesstimate, I, I have no idea. Uh, maybe in the last 25 years, three. No, not how, but how many, how many you think should be put up? Well, they have to work for it, sir. They got to work for it. If you're not working, you're not, you know, you can't come here without work. You have to work. And I'm, when I say work, I'm saying work in here, not work out there, work in here. That's where it's at. That's what made me mess up, me in here. Not out there, here. So would you agree that other people have worked in here and they're not before us today? Not like I have worked. You're the hottest worker out of I'm everyone worker, yes. in prison? Yes, sir. Okay. I know my skills. Thank you. Thank you, Thank sir. you. Any up, Councilor Rod Thank you. Well, I want to thank you for all the time that you afforded me. We met almost three hours. And uh, I was touched that you were concerned about me driving home in the dark because I'm from Watertown and yeah. Bridgewater. I was there before I, I met with another inmate. But um, anyway, I did drive in the dark. But I want to tell you, I bought a GPS that morning because I said, I've got to make sure this works. <laughs> it had all the old exit numbers. <laughs> so, but, but I managed. But... Um, it was a, I really appreciate the time you gave me to really know you. 
um, I meet with everyone, not voting on a piece of paper. I want to know the whole person. Mm -hmm. And I feel I know everything about you all your life and everything. We laughed, we cried. It was it was great meaning. Um, could you tell us how drugs affected the tragic decision that you made? I have to start from Vietnam. I never was a user, alcoholic, or anything. I was a hardworking young man at the time when I was drafted. But being an American citizen, they draft you, go, you go, you make your call. <clears throat> Got to Vietnam. Morale there at the time when I got there was very, very low. Men were refusing orders. Men were still dying. So much was going on back in our country at the time. We could call home, and our parents and friends and wives were telling us what was going on back home. But when I got to the company that I was in, in Quang Tri, the, north, the northern part of Vietnam, everybody's on drugs. Everybody's on drugs. They got tired. So we're tired of being here. So if we use drugs just to, kill, just to get out of the mode of the possibility of being killed, that's what we did just to maintain ourselves because there was a lot of stress and pressure there at the time. I know I was there and I seen our men die. So the drugs, that's where they came at. I'm sorry I picked up that habit. I brought it home here, and I heard two people for that. I'm responsible for that. That lives with me every day, what I did. I'm sorry. Drugs, I haven't touched any drugs since 1983, 40-something years, and I'm touching no more again. So I'm good with drugs. Well, I, I, I um, my husband was in Vietnam. I have friends that died in Vietnam, and I apologize to all the veterans who were treated so badly. I belong to the American Legion, and we are trying to make up to it. But um, but what I saw in you, in, in meeting with you, um, you are truly a religious person. You know, we hear all these people all born again. You know, a lot of it is a lot of baloney. You're the real, you're the real thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we can't turn back the clock. What happened did. And as you said, you live with it every day. And uh, we have to forgive. And um, I cry at parade, so you got to know that. But um, I just have to say that um, you really have gone through a lot. And when we spoke, I couldn't imagine being on death row. And of course, that was overturned. But you've gone through all of it. You've helped a lot of people in a lot of programs. Um, and, and you went through, um, um, what is it, what, 50 rehabilitation, am I right? 50 rehabilitation um, yes. uh, programs. Yes. That's amazing. Yeah. So, um, you know, you are so excited about going out and getting that job, and you've got a wonderful doctor and wife who are going to be who your mentors. God bless them. Thank and you. so... Um, I'm going to stop because I'm, I'm going to cry, but I just, I just got to tell you that that was so meaningful meeting with you, and uh, it, it was the best three hours I've spent to get to know you. Thank you, Mel. So Thank you. you have my support. Thank you, Mel. Thank you. I just have a quick question, then I'll go to Councillor Ox. I know you're 71 years old, but I'm just curious. Maybe I missed it. What do you plan to do if you're released, and where do you plan to live? Well, First of all, I'm playing with my Mr. Parker. He's going to get me a job in the mental health field because that's where I want to work. I want to give back there. I want to give back because there's a lot of mental health problems out there, and I see it coming, the kids coming in through the day, in prisons today. It reminds me. I want to be in that field of work, and he can give me a nice job with that. I'm going to be living in Newton. Live where? Living in Newton. And who, uh, you don't have to tell me the names, like a family or a pot? Yes. A family. A family. Okay, thank you very much. Councilor Terry Kennedy. Um, I asked that same question that um, Councilor Arnell just asked, which I indicated to the attorney earlier. I'm very interested in what the plan is. We talked about it a little bit on the phone last night, but what the plan is going forward. We can't hear you, Terry. I'm sorry, Mary. My microphone's off. Yeah, I was talking about you, Mary. That's why I had the microphone on. 
Um, the um, first of all, I apologize that I didn't get down to see you. Uh, yes. I, I was trying to do that, but I had some personal issues come up that you know, lawyers well aware of, uh, so I wasn't able to. Um, but the um, we've been talking quite a bit, and uh, like, she's a superstar, by the way. For you. Like, she's like, you know, she'll be on the super lawyers cover this year with uh, getting you to this point. And I happen to know her. I've seen her in court. She does a tremendous job there as well. Uh, but the um, I'm going to get back to your plan in a moment. But uh, did you say you were in Vietnam for a month? Yes. And that's a, an extremely short period of time. Yes, it is. Uh, yes, it, it was, sir. Uh, what caused you to come back so quickly? As I got the Queen Tree. You what? When I got the Queen Tree province, that's where I was stationed. Yeah, the northern both northern border of north north South Vietnam. The DMZ was right there. The morale was very low. Drugs was there. Oh, I'm sure. And a lot of men was refusing orders going out into the field. A lot of men. So I just fell in line with the rest of them. No, uh, there weren't many people there that were there that were volunteers at the time. Most no, people we was all ripped, draftees, ripped out of their all homes draftees. And, and brought their very young men, unfortunately. They're 19, 20, 21 year old kids. But were, were you discharged from the. I was discharged on honorable conditions. A general discharge under honorable conditions. Okay. But I still had my benefits. Okay, but that was pretty quick. I, I, was, I was surprised because, uh, you know, I was. When you. I find a little. I've never heard that where somebody went there for thirty days, and yeah. they, unless they had wounded or hurt or yeah, something well, happened, that they're, they're, they're back of, so quick. A lot of that was going on, sir. That people don't know what's going on over there. Well, I'm sure. A lot I, of I don't. I don't friends, doubt that. And um, right. you know, a lot of uh, young men' lives were ruined. Or they died there. Yeah. Uh, no question about it. We didn't deserve to be there. In any event, so so you come back. You're not suggesting that you got addicted to drugs in that 30-day period, right? I did get addicted to drugs in 30 that, days. That quick? That quick. I that, never Nothing before drug. that? Nothing. Nothing. It, My body it, just absorbed it. Okay. And, and um, on the day of this event, you, you indicated you were under the influence of LSD? Yes, sir. Was that the drug of choice that you had from Vietnam? Is that yes. That you got addicted yeah, that to? That was one of them, LSD I know heroin. it was very common in the 70s. Yeah, honest, LSD and heroin, God, yes. common now, but... Um, so you started abusing LSD when you first got there, the first month? First couple of days. First couple of days. And, um, you know, when I look at the fact that you testified at your trial, and you testified that on the day of the offense, you were under the influence of LSD. But there was some planning that went into this ahead of time. It wasn't, um, it wasn't a crime of uh, opportunity, shall we say. It, 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 you planned it out ahead of time. You, you, you got weapons uh, to rob it. You must have sort of cased the place to know that they were bringing money in there, right? Well, my co-defendant worked there. Okay. So you and your co by the way, is he still, what, what's his deal? Is he still in prison? Is he alive? Yeah, he's, he's still in prison. Okay. I don't know if he's alive or not. I'm not. No, I'm just saying he's still in prison. He's, he is still in prison. Yeah. He, he actually still has, I believe, um, uh, he never had a direct appeal. So I think he's currently litigating. He never had a direct appeal on a first degree murder? No, both uh, Mr. Shabazz and uh, his co-defendant, Mr. White, had counseled that seems to have dropped the ball and um, they had a death he had the death penalty he never had a direct appeal on a death penalty case mr shabazz eventually did a number of years later but it is mentioned in the decision in the sjc's decision that his counsel had his appeal was originally dismissed because his counsel never on a death penalty case that's correct that's astounding the sjc was very disturbed <laughs> I always thought death penalty cases had an automatic direct appeal. I believe at the time there was, um, it, it was a bit of a different process. You had to, there was an assignment of errors that you had I to go know. through. And I think that my understanding is that um, uh, neither Mr. Shabazz's counsel nor Mr. White's counsel went through with that process. And as a result, both of their appeals were just dismissed. Um, in Mr. Shabazz's case, the error was corrected. There was successor counsel, uh, but the SJC noted in their decision that his attorney had actually done the same thing on another death penalty case. 
um, and I think mentioned that perhaps there should be some action taken by the lower courts um, with respect to Mr. Shabazz's attorney. Mr. And is that what led to the uh, death penalty being vacated? No, I, it was just Furman versus Georgia. It was okay. the fact that it had been ruled right. unconstitutional at the time. Um, I'm curious, just in, on the procedural side, I'll get back to what it was. On the procedural th side of things, he filed a motion for a new trial in 2019. Tell I me about that. I believe it was 2020. Oh, 20. Okay. Yeah. And that that was th that was voluntarily withdrawn a year later. What was the That's basis of that motion for a new trial? Do you want, if I, you know, I can I can speak to it. Uh, it please. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was filed pro se, um, but uh, Mr. Shabazz um, has filed a number of motions over the years, and all of them have to do with mitigating um, circumstances at the time. So the 2020 motion was about adolescent brain development um, and PTSD as okay. mitigating evidence that he believed should have been presented Um not not as evidence that he was not guilty, right. but with respect to the possibility for parole to have right. a parole eligible sentence. Mitigating circumstances that would have potentially avoided a death sentence of life without parole. That's Bring, bringing it down to a second degree, basically, which is what we're here to do today. Um, okay, so the um, so you 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 did your time in the service. You come out, you're on, you, how often were you using LSD? As often as I can get it, sir. Huh? As often as I could get it at the time. Okay. You know, the your case is more difficult for us, you understand yeah. that, than yes, the I other do. two conversations yes, we had. Yes. Um, Mr. Allen, who's present, was convicted under the old felony murder rule, he didn't actually um, commit the murder himself. And Mr. Coons that we did, I, I saw a very strong self-defense case that I was shocked that he was convicted when I read through all of his materials. Yours is more difficult yes, it is, for the sir. people on this council, and I think you can understand why. Yes. Um, the folks who died, have, 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 do they still have family around? Have, has there been any input with, in this process from them? My, my understanding is that um, the advisory board of pardons I, I understand they reached out and i believe that there was no response there was just two of them on zoom today i believe they are okay uh maybe i'm wrong but i, I thought i read that someone was going to be on zoom okay i'm, I'm not we'll aware we'll, we'll, we'll certainly find that out but um i'm just curious because i know that with mr coons and mr allen there was input um one was opposed to the commutation and one member of the family and the other one were in favor of it and I was just curious about that. So, um, you know, it, the planning part of this, you, you, it's easy to say I was under the influence of LSD that day and have no memory of it, but the planning took some thought. You would agree with that? On LSD and not on LSD, you had to plan it out. I had many years to think about this, yes. You know, you know yeah. what I mean? It's, yes. it, it's, um, and it's, uh, it, it makes it more difficult yes, for the uh, people on, uh, on this uh, council, um, so just so yeah, so you, it was a lot of money at the time. It was like twenty thousand dollars in nineteen seventy one. That was a lot of money. Yes. Um, so it wasn't just a, a small uh, robbery. Um, the um, all right. So now now you get convicted and, and you go to jail and you clearly have done a lot of good things while you're in jail. There's no question about that. Uh, you, you you did everything you could. You worked at it very, very hard. That's why I was a little curious about your, your co-defendant, because um, he would be in the exact same circumstance you are, or should be, if he's done the same kind of things in jail. I know that you wouldn't know that. You're not responsible for what he may have done or not done since he's been there. But, but I'm curious where we have two people that committed the same crime together and are guilty of two murders while one's here and one's not. Uh, I just, but that's a different issue. So anyway, so um, let's talk about when you get out, because uh, I think that uh, I'm very, very curious as to what your plans are. I, I certainly addressed that with Mr. Allen, Mr. Coons, uh, and uh, Mr. Allen's I got a chance to speak with for just a moment before we started, and he seems to be doing terrific, uh, doing everything. And one of the things that, that he was very proud of was the things that he's still doing to give back uh, on the outside. And uh, that's certainly what we want to hear about. What are you going to do to give back? You're not a young man. 
you know, um, you're not an old man, but you're not, I'm not far behind you, but you're not a young man. So um, it, it's. It is somebody who is, say, 50 or 41. Uh, excuse me, so I'm 73, but... 73? 73. Okay. All right. But I've been working all my life. In prison, that's what I do. Right. If I'm parole, that's what I'll continue to do. <laughs> I have cooking skills, I have okay. electrical skills, carpentry skills, plumbing okay. skills, a, a mentor, a teacher. I could be a, a, a professor. I have a master's degree. So I got many, many things that I can do out in society. Okay. And, and I, I want to give back. That's my way of giving back. I want to give back. Well, working is great. And that, that's one thing I think is good for anybody who's yes. coming out of the, I think you need that when you come out of the system, the structure of it. But let's talk about uh, what you got, how you're going to give back in other ways. I mean, working is to keep you on the right track and, and to fill up your day and to Give yourself some sense of worth as you're out there. I agree with all that. But, like, what are you going to do to, uh, in terms of talking about your experience and who you're going to talk to about it when you're on the outside? Oh, well, I'm definitely going to be getting counseling. I mean, you need counseling. My PTSD counseling, definitely. Because uh, I like talking to other veterans about our experiences. That's, yeah. that's more important to me. Like I said, I'm, just, I'm in a PTSD group, group now in Old Colony. We talk about experience. We don't have we have Vietnam veterans, and Iraqi veterans, and Afghan veterans sure. in prison now. So we talk about experience and the things we need to do for ourselves to make ourselves better persons. So when we do return back to society, we can help out, help other veterans. Okay. I work with autistic children. I work with them a couple of years at Colin. We had programs for them coming into Old Colin. We had a marathon for, for the uh, Franciscan House in Bar in uh, Brockton. We raised ten thousand dollars with our Chain Games Runner Club, and one of our testimonies that came today, Mr. Carl Bowen, was brought his runners in, and we ran the inside of the yard of Oak Colony as a marathon. BBA came in and measured out the mileage for us, and we had a marathon a couple of times. And we raised ten thousand dollars. I donate to charities on the street now, so I want to give back. I just need the opportunity to give back more, okay, more, and I will do that. Um, you know, uh, Council Juvenile has brought up many times uh, that he doesn't believe in life without parole, and neither do I. I don't. I believe everybody should have the opportunity, at least the hope of uh, of uh, getting parole. And I think that uh, you know, people are capable of redemption. They're capable of of, um, uh, of bettering themselves, and should have the opportunity to reenter into society. Uh, as I sit here, I would say there's about a 99% chance that I'm going to vote in favor of your commutation. For that reason alone, one of the things that people don't understand is that when we commute a sentence, you're not walking out free. You, you don't walk out of, if we voted right now to commute your sentence, you're going back to jail and you have to get paroled. And I expect that you're going to spend whatever years you have left on this planet on parole uh, and subject to um, the rules and regulations of the parole board uh, and being monitored uh, in society for the rest of your life. Uh, that's what happens when you get a second parole on a second degree murder. So um, I don't have any other questions for you. I'm looking forward to hearing from your witnesses. Uh, once again, you're sitting next to a, a superstar. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Councilor Duff. Thank you very much. So you served in the army yes ma'am i'm correct and were you proud to serve yes ma'am do you love your country yes ma'am i was born here i gotta love it it's the only country in the world for lump sir what Look was the most shocking or i guess the shocking is the right word i want to use what was the most shocking thing to you when you arrived in vietnam seeing so many young men there we was, we were babies. Just, school. I graduated in 1968. 1969, I'm in, in the service. 1970, I'm in Vietnam. Yeah. Was it difficult to acclimatize? 
I mean, I, I know I'm going way back asking yeah. these questions. May I give you an example? Yes, you will. May, please. When we arrived in Vietnam at 2.30 in the morning, 300 of us on the plane coming from there to there, here to there. The sergeant said, duck your heads because we got to go through this town and they take pot shots at us when we go through the town. We're in a bus. Keep your heads down till we get to the other side. Well, we got to the other side. We rolled off the bus, called everyone's name. It was this one name that kept calling. So I said, check the bus to see if he's on it. He was on the bus. He had caught one in his head. He didn't, he, he didn't duck. So they bring his body off the bus. And he said, this is what happens when you don't pay attention. This is what happens when you don't pay attention to the orders we give you. He said, now we have to write his parents. That for the first time ever in my life, I've ever seen a body, young body, I think he was about 20. But that, when that traumatized the other events that I've seen in Vietnam, that just takes a lot out of you. It's quite an introduction to the country. Um, how were you introduced to uh, LSD? And I'm going to, I'm going to uh, guess heroin, since it was so much heroin coming. I, full disclosure, I lived in Vietnam at one point, so I'm okay. very familiar with the country and very familiar with the area you were in. And uh, anyway, but this is about you. How were you introduced to heroin there? Like I say, the morale, the company I was in was very low. Everyone was using drugs. Did people just give them to you, or did was, they say, try this? Or? It, was, it was that accessible to us. I mean, yeah. I was in the armor division, so they would go out in the field and, you know, out in the field. If you're from Vietnam, you know how it was back then that, you know, Papa Son had his little house out there, a little village, and they'd be making whatever they have to make. And, of course, American soldiers, we're going to buy it up. And when they came back on base, they had as much as you want, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know one veteran who's come back from any war uh, since Vietnam without PTSD, I'll be honest. And I'm sure many of the men and women from the previous wars did too, and it was just completely undiagnosed. Um, do you hold any resentment towards your country for sending you there? Oh, I, I love being there, but at a, such a young age, Seeing young men die, young women die, 20, 21 year old people haven't even lived yet. At the time when, when I was growing up, you know, we was just trying to learn how to drive a car, mm -hmm. get our first jobs, and to be drafted without feeling, fulfilling that. And you get traumatized, and you come home and you look for help. And, and at the time, PTSD wasn't out, but Shell shock was. Right. You know, but no one didn't call it shell shock. They just didn't know. And so you did try to seek services, mental health services. I went to uh, the Boston, uh, the Jamaica Plain VA several times. Yep. And I told them, I said, look, I'm not myself. I knew something was wrong other than the drugs, but I thought it was the drugs. Right. They said, we can't help you. I said, well, I just come from Vietnam. Here's my DD-214 right here. It shows you. Yeah, we know, we know, we know. There's a lot of you guys coming back from Vietnam, and we don't know what's wrong with you. So I asked the doctor, two doctors. I said, you know that we're coming back from Vietnam with a problem, and you can't tell us what it is? I said, no, we don't know what's wrong with you guys. We have no idea. So it was a comorbidity, really. Uh, at least that's what we would call it, is, is the 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 mental health challenge of PTSD and the addiction. Yeah. And you knew something was wrong. You tried to get help, and you just spiraled. Is, is that a correct? Yes, I, I spiraled after that. because I went to the Boston City Hospital on Harrison Avenue, the old city, Boston mm -hmm. City Hospital, seeking the same thing, help. Hey, help me, help me. I'm not myself. Tell me something. And I said, I'm a Vietnam veteran. I just returned back a couple months ago. I need some help. Can you help me? 
And the person said, well, we don't help Vietnam because you got your own hospital. So despite all of this, and this is not, you know, I always say this doesn't abstain, this doesn't absolve your no. crime. I'm trying, but I'm trying to build a, a mental picture of how this, how you even got to, to that spot. Despite all these um, great, you know, frankly, for lack of a, probably not with malice from, from people, but the, the inequities that you faced coming back as a veteran, you hold no resentment or malice towards your country. No. And you feel proud to have served. Can I tell you a story? Please. The day I was discharged, <clears throat> coming through Logan Airport, which is not Logan Airport today, the way I came through at the time, uh, I have my uniform on. Best greens, shop, creases, medals. And I'm walking through Logan Airport. This kid yells out, it's early morning, Mommy, there's one over there. So I, I looked around like everyone else looked. Who's he talking to? And as this mother walking toward it, she started calling me, You murderers, how many people you kill? How many babies you kill? Nothing but murderers, you Vietnam veterans, is all you all do. So, and as she yelled at me, I'm looking at her. The kid, the son, kicks me in my shin and spit on my shoes. And I was telling, something hit me on my hand, on my shoulder here. I didn't know who it was. Could have been a person, I don't know. They just move along. I heard a voice that just move along. I just moved, kept moving like everyone else. I was, I was flabbergasted that that happened. I'm here representing our country, and here you are calling me a murderer. You don't even know what I did. I have no idea, but yet, I accepted it and kept moving. So what I'm getting mad at country for, I have to serve my country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next we'll hear from Councilor DePaulo. I just wanna remind you, we have an extremely busy day. Uh, everyone can ask as many, many questions as they want. We're gonna break sometime before one o'clock. Uh, and if we do not finish, and I think I told your attorney, we will come back another day because they have a hearing at one o'clock that I've talked to Councilor Kennedy. That will say at one o'clock. Hopefully the goal is to finish before then, but I'm just putting everyone on notice. Okay. Uh, we will break before one, whether that means at 12 15, I'm not sure, but keep that in mind. Okay. Councillor DePaulo, do you have any questions? I do, Councillor. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, if it's okay, I'd like to ask your attorney a couple questions, Mr. Shabazz, before I talk to you. Um, so first off, thank you for working on this case. Um, we have a need for attorneys to be willing to devote themselves to commutation cases because they apparently take so long. Uh, and obviously, um, there's not a lot of folks who specialize in it. So thank you for that. And to everyone else uh, here who worked on this uh, to get us to this point. Um, I wanna ask about the process. In 2014, I don't think you were involved, but there was an initial commutation petition submitted to the parole board. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. And what was the result of that petition? Um, so the, uh, another attorney submitted um, Mr. Chabuz's petition in 2014, and there was no, I think there was a supplement that was filed in 2016. Um, there was no action taken on it. Um, in 2020, uh, in May, when I got involved in the case, um, was the first time that I believe Mr. Shabazz received a any sort of response from um, the first time since the initial twenty in two thousand and fourteen. So yes. six years yes. before any there was response that, came. Correct, and okay. and at that point he received a letter, um, I think, indicating that he had. 30 days or something to supplement um, his petition. So at that point I became involved and advised the board that I needed to, I needed more time to, to supplement the petition. Sure. And they gave us plenty of time. Um, and so I, when I finally filed the petition that you now have before you, um, I asked to withdraw, just to have a clean slate, have everything together at, to withdraw what had been previously filed and put it all together in, in the petition I filed in November 2021. And then what was, when did the hearing happen? The hearing took place um, 
I believe it's July 26th of 2022. So it was filed November 1st, 2021. Okay. So it's a long process. Yes, very long process. And I imagine there was a lot of diligence by the parole board. I, I think that, um, you know, the there have been, there's been increasing responsiveness. Mm -hmm. um, certainly um, when we learned of the fact that Mr. Shabazz was going to have a hearing that was in January of 2022, I believe. So mm -hmm. um, there were a couple months where we just really weren't sure what sure. was going to happen. Um, sure. and, and then you had your hearing and I received a report from yes. the parole board, pretty detailed explanation of the recommendation they made. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, so I just wanted to know about that process because I appreciate the parole board um, doing its work in, in providing this info yeah. so that I'm not just getting your side of the story. I'm seeing what the Commonwealth is presenting or what, what the parole board is presenting to us. So um, with that, Mr. Shabazz, thank you for your service. Thank you. Um, heard a little bit about it today that I won't rehash, but do you think we're where we are but for your service? Do you think we're where we are if you had not been called to Vietnam? I think I would be a retired old man now. Yeah. Um, you wrote a master's thesis about Vietnam vets. Yes, I did. What could you elaborate on what your angle was on that? At the time, it was 1995. My best friend, like I said, Marjorie Schweiker, she was my master's thesis advisor. Mm -hmm. I wanted to write something about us, incarcerated Vietnam veterans, because no one at that time, as far as I could be, there wasn't anything out there about being incarcerated veterans. Mm -hmm. And so I set off on the project of doing that because I am an incarcerated Vietnam veteran. Could I ask you, as you continue, uh, at that time, were there, were you incarcerated alongside a lot of vets? Yes, I was. It was a significant portion of the yes. population? Well, I was in Norfolk at the time, yeah. uh, maybe about 100 guys. About 100. Okay, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Keep, you can keep going. So you, you were there wasn't a lot out there about incarcerated Vietnam vets that you had seen, and so you you undertook this. And what what was the just thrust this, of your thesis? The thought was just hopefully hoping that you know the powers that be would do something for us. That's that's the basic purpose of me writing that thesis. That hopefully somewhere down the line, someone will wake up and say, "Hey, we got what about what about the incarcerated Vietnam vets? Let's help them." Let's, mm -hmm. Help them. Sure. And in your uh, experience, I imagine you've paid attention to these issues over the years, is yes, what I would guess. Is that accurate? Yes. So are, are things different? I mean, when we have Iraq war veterans, uh, folks who've seen combat in Afghanistan, are those, is, has much changed? Are, are, do we have a lot of veterans from those wars in prison now? They're coming in. What were the biggest uh, were the biggest challenges back then that at that time writing that thesis you thought Vietnam veterans would benefit from incarcerated Vietnam veterans? Is it the same diagnosis that you would make today about young folks who are in? No, nah, because you have so many programs out here now. You have the DAV, the mm -hmm. Warrior Wounded Warriors program. You have professional programs. You had the all kind of programs for veterans today coming home. Uh, when they come home today, you got the people at the airport waiting on them. Their families are right there, you know, mm -hmm. getting off the plane and hugging them, kissing them. When we came from Vietnam, it was nothing. Yeah. Nothing. And as far as programs available while incarcerated, the parole board documented a lot that you've done. Um, and you've talked about hope a couple times. Uh, we know, you know, folks who pay attention to this know the governor's clemency guidelines talk about um, commutations intended to serve as a strong motivation for confined persons to utilize available resources for self-development and self-improvement. Um, and as you also noted, you're at the third commutation in, in quite a long time. So you're, you're working on these fellowship programs, right? There's mentoring that you've been able to do in, in different um, kind of niches. So, I mean, can, like, let's be real, is, are the, the folks you're mentoring, do they feel hope based on the three experiences? Um, and, and what does it look like? The hope that I, I gave the, the Vietnam veterans, I hope they're still trying. Yeah. They're still trying to come, come here, get here, get this far. 
but some don't have lawyers, some don't have family because they've been in so long, 45, 50 year men. Mm -hmm. And some women have been incarcerated that long too, that I noticed doing first degree life at Framingham, mm -hmm. 45 years in. So we're just looking for hope. So if you're granted this commutation and then perhaps uh, granted parole, I don't sense that you're any threat to public safety. Do you feel that? No, sir. I'm understanding I, the situation have, accurately. I have so much support, as you can see. I mean, I have support. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any before. I have support now, family, friends, people I met while I was incarcerated are still here today. Mm -hmm. You served 51 years. That's a long time. Yes. You've undertaken quite a bit of self-improvement and self-reflection. Um, and uh, I can't see any reason why we should be devoting state resources to keeping you behind bars. Um, so I'm going to be very proud um, to vote in favor of this Thank uh, commutation. You. Thank, Thank you very you. much, uh, Thank Councilor DePaolo. Mr. Chavez, did you ever incarcerated for 50 years, give or take. Have you ever filed for commutation before this? And either your attorney can answer this if she wants. Uh, I think that there was a petition that was filed in 2010, mm -hmm. pro se. So he was convicted and went to jail 198, what was the date? He was convicted in 1972. 1972. Yeah. So he waited, what, 20, 38 years before filing a commutation? Petition. I, I'm my math is not wonderful, but I will okay, give it a take. Give it a take. <laughs> I really I'm trying to run those numbers. That in well. geography will make best subjects. Uh, civics. I'm yeah. kidding. Uh, why did why did he wait so long? I mean, we've had commutation petitions that come before us that a lot sooner than that. Um, I'm smiling because the governors that came in. After Willie Hood and Armathir and escaped off of programs, they shut everything down. So everything was shut down until 25 years ago when I, I an inmate named Joe Yano got a commutation. Yeah. And now just Will Allen and Thomas Cook, the next two came up. So, you know, I just kept busy working. No, I got it. Uh, I, I get that. So you filed it in 2000, what, 2010? 2010. And it went to the parole board? Yes. Advisory boards of pardons and they rejected it. Or, yes. And okay, they rejected it, and now you're here before us today. Okay. Uh, you know, to me, whether someone wants a pardon or a commutation, the first thing you have to do is you got to own up to it. You yes. got to own up to it. You clearly have done that. Yes, sir. You appear to be very remorseful. You have a as good as anyone uh, a good institutional record. Okay, that's important. Yes, you know, for that long a period, you could, someone could say, hey, you know, you you, you go off and who knows what you might do. Mm -hmm. But you, you've done as good as anyone, uh, at least that, I, that I've seen. So I commend you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, looks like you have a plan. You're going to be working with, with, with somebody. Uh, you're going to live in Newton. You have a place to live. Uh, and when we sit here, we never know. I mean, we just listen to you. We listen to your witnesses, your attorney. And we try to make our best judgment. Yes. Uh, and I say this to all the people, you know, who sit there, you know, more likely than not, it's just my own personal opinion that your uh, sentence will be commuted. But don't let us down. Don't let your lawyer down. Don't let the victim's family down. You owe it to yourself and to your family and your friends. You know, I hope you're going to do the right thing. And I hope the only time we see you again, uh, is that you'll be here like Mr. Allen, yes. uh, and he, and he. I'm glad we we, we supported him, yeah. but uh, I wish you the best, uh, and that's all I have to say. Do you have anything else you want to say? You don't have to. One one thing that uh, my heart says is, I will never let anyone down for helping me and my family and my supporters to reduce my sentence to second degree. I will not let anyone down. That's from here. Not here, it's from here. Well, thank you. And I mean my, that. My understanding, uh, Attorney Teitelbaum, on our last commutations, the folks got out relatively quick. What does that mean? My understanding in talking to parole, not on this case, but in general, people get out two months, give or take. Does that sound right to you? 
Um, I believe that, uh, at least in, in Mr. Allen's case, I think that the parole hearing was held about five or six weeks after the governor's council voted. And then I think he was released maybe a month or so. Okay, so within two to three months. Yes. Okay, so. okay, well, that's good. Well, thank you very much. I just want to acknowledge a letter that I did receive from Catherine Moran, the victim service unit director at the Mass Parole Board. Uh, counselors, I want to let you know that I have been in contact with victim families on the Ramadan Shabazz case. I have been in communications with Nancy Shaw, the wife of victim Harry Jeffries. She lives out of state and would like to observe the hearing virtually. She does not want to provide testimony, but she is watching virtually. And uh, at this point, she does not want to uh, allow uh, give any testimony. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll hear from uh, William Allen, who is uh, very familiar with the council. Um, he's a friend, he's a supporter, and he's a commutation recipient. And, you know, as I indicated uh, to Mr. Shabab's attorney, we want to limit uh, the statement, uh, and I will hold everyone, you know, if, they, if it goes too long, whatever too long means, we'll figure that out. But if you just stay your statement and uh, the counselors have any questions, they can ask you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for having me again. Um, it's an honor to speak on behalf of Ramadan. <laughs> Um, I would like to start this off by giving thanks to our Lord, because none of this would have been possible without God. Also, I'd like to give thanks to Governor Baker, Lieutenant Governor Polito, for believing in Coons and I, Mr. Coons and I, that we would help to make a difference in society's eyes. And to be honest with you, we are carrying our brothers and sisters on our backs comfortably. I give thanks to the governor's council, the advisory board of pardons, my attorneys, and second chance justice, a campaign of Brockton Interfaith Community and partnership with the Massachusetts Communities Action Network. I sit here today with happiness because I have a chance and opportunity to speak on behalf of a great man who I love and respect with every inch of my being. When I first met Ramadan, he was a tutor for the school program, mentor for the vulnerable, and a role model to many, including myself, staff, and anyone that came in contact with Mr. Ramadan respected him because of the way he carried himself and also how he treated others. Ramadan and I were in the same unit for over 11 years. We talked every day and ate occasionally together in the unit when Charles Hall food was terrible. He shared his knowledge with me and he also shared his food. I never went without knowledge and or a full belly thanks to my brother Ramadan. Ramadan was one of the first to help give the campaign program the respect it has today. Um, let me close with a story. That um, is so profound that it's still being talked about till this present day. There was a patient that we will call the Heisman, and they kept him locked in a cage in the back of the unit by himself. They considered him to be the most dangerous, but all he wanted was love and attention. So our companion leaders matched Ramadan with Heisman, which was a wonderful thing because Ramadan gave Heisman the freedom and love that he was seeking. Because of Ramadan's advocacy, they stopped cuffing Heisman, and I would see him walking around the quad with Ramadan. Everyone saw the change in Heisman. Now Heisman is doing great and no longer locked in a cage 24 seven. Over to my left, I support, as many do, for this council to grant Mr. Shabazz his freedom because he is deserving of it and we need has helped to continue the good work that we are doing for our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any of the con Council of Juvenile? How you doing? I'm doing great. Yeah, how's work? Work is wonderful. 
Yeah. Right, yes. What's the story with the beard now? <laughs> I said to myself, I said, self, you know, I see Mr. Juneville. It's cold. <laughs> <laughs> so keep my face warm. <laughs> Thank you very much for your very kind letter. Thank Councilor you. Terry Please Kennedy. Thank you. All right, Councilor Kennedy. Thank you so much. And and thank you very much, Councillor DePaulo. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see you. Um, I just want you to know how proud I was to make this vote and how much uh, you and Mr. Koontz have impacted uh, the community. Um, in my world, uh, given the hope we talked about at your hearing and just now, and also among the legal community, folks starting to pay attention and think this is something that's a valuable use of my time to be pursuing these things. So I just wanted to commend you on that. I'm so glad to see you doing well. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Councilor Marilyn Devaney. Thank you. How nice to see you out. Um, um, I would be, be remiss if I didn't thank you again for all the time that you afforded me when I came out to meet with you. Yeah. And um, I have to admit, after we met, I went in my car and I cried. Travesty of justice. There's so much racial disparity in our courts and we see it, but nothing is done about it. And I'm not gonna retry the trial, but here's someone who wasn't even in the room when his friend murdered a man, stabbed him 12 times and killed him. And he got life in prison without parole. You would have cried after you met with him too. But when I met with Ramadan, he talked about you and he talked about the friendship that you had formed and what a wonderful, wonderful act for you to come and speak on his behalf. I really, and um, we've been in touch and we'll be seeing each other again. And I'm so happy you got your license you, with your dad, you know, um, we have to go forward, can't live in the past. And, um, but I just wanna thank you for coming and testifying. Uh, you're a good friend. And um, the programs that you put in, the people that um, profited by it, who came at your hearing, and uh, you're a good religious person, Eucharistic minister, you got inmates to come to church every day. That's pretty good. So um, I just wanna thank you for coming and your testimony means a lot, but we talked about you. Your ears must have been ringing, but it, it, it was a, a pleasure meeting you and we're gonna meet again and uh, you have a wonderful future. Thank you so much. So God bless you. Thank you very much. I don't have any questions. Just let you know, so far, so good. You're making us proud. You're making yourself proud. Uh, and you're making your family, your friends, keep up the good work. Councilor Ferrara, just Thank you. did you want to have a question? I hear everyone saying how well you're doing, but I, I have no idea what you're doing. So could you tell us what you're doing? <laughs> um, I work at Tefanchi and Toyota's in Brantree. Um, I, I go around and I do talks. I spoke at Northeastern University Law School. Um, stu, um, school. Um, I'm doing a, um, me and Peg Newman, we're doing a, um, an event at St. Suzanne's talking about criminal justice. And I have more up and coming um, events, you know, in January, because they want, they, they want me to speak again at Northeastern University. Was well, it you and Mr. Kutz that wanted to be a barber? I forget. Yes, I'm a, I'm a master barber. You're a master yes, barber. I'm a master Are barber. you cutting hair now? Are you doing that? Um, I cut I don't, um I cut off and on, no, because okay. I cut my father's dreads off. So, <laughs> all right. But that was that was pretty good. So your situation, as Councilor Kennedy alluded to earlier, was quite different. You were in another room when the murder took place. Uh, murder felony rule. This man's alleged to have killed two people within three feet. Cold blooded murder. Yes. They didn't have a chance. He just went out there, killed them dead, yeah. without even asking for the money. Do you think that we should look at that a little different than your case? No. Why not? Because a mistake happened both ways. 
and we all make mistakes. You know, it's about how we overcome it. And if, you know, you're sincere about correcting that mistake, you know, you shouldn't be punished for the rest of your life. But if you make it, if you make, if you, if you have, if you're awarded a chance and you mess that chance up, then, you know, you gave your, you gave your chance. You what gave. about the, uh, what about the other people in prison, first degree murder? Maybe not quite as heinous as killing two people within three feet. Why aren't they here? Like, do you think like you three are the hottest working in prison? Not like, at what, all. So what is the process and what would you say like, um, in fairness to other people that are, that are left behind? Well, I think, I think, you know, if you do the work on yourself, cause the first thing you have to do is work on yourself. You know, you can't work on somebody else if you don't work on yourself. You know, you know what you did wrong. You know what you have to do to correct yourself. So <laughs> once you get the tools that you need for yourself, you can apply it on others. In your experience, uh, are there a lot of people that are still in jail that should be before us? I, I agree, yes. There's a lot of good men and women out there that are deserving of this opportunity. But, you know, like I, like I said at Northeastern, I said, we buried that Willie Horton apple. And Coons and I planted some new ones. And we're like Cinderella. The apple is red. And we don't, we have no problem carrying our brothers and sisters on our backs. Because if we mess up, we close the door for everyone else. And that's not going to happen. I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad you take it so serious. Thank you for coming in. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Uh, next, we'll hear from Dr. Richard Parker. Uh, he's a friend and uh, he's a supporter. Good to see you, doctor. Thank you. It's good to be here. This is a, a joyful day. Um, thank you, uh, counselors, and uh, good morning, Ramadan. Good morning. Good morning, good morning Attorney Teitelbaum. Mm -hmm. um, I have a few notes. I promise I will not be long, but I do want to say a few things. Um, my summary of Ramadan's situation is there are no excuses but there is forgiveness. Um, I also wish to reflect on the losses for the families of Mr. Calvin Thorne and Mr. Harry Jeffries. I don't think we can ever forget them. Um, they paid the ultimate price in this situation, not Mr. Shabazz. I believe his remorse is real. I believe his remorse is persistent. Um, our family goes way back with Ramadan. Uh, my wife is here. Chrissy Parker and her mother, Marjorie Stryker, who's passed away, worked in the prison and uh, met Ramdan in 1983. So we're almost on 40 years that the Parker family has known Ramadan. I think it's ironic that his tragedy, Ramadan's tragedy, began in Vietnam in 1970. Um, our oldest son is 30. He's in Hanoi right now as a tourist. He sent a picture, he's playing keyboard in a restaurant, how times have changed. Vietnam has come a long way. I think Ramadan has come a long way. I think we've all come a long way. I feel that we cannot judge an entire person's being on the actions of one day. And I think his efforts to better himself are impressive and real. Got a BA in prison, he got a master's degree. Mm -hmm. I'm personally touched by the fact that he chose to help mentally ill people which is not an easy thing to do. Um, about myself briefly, I'm a physician. I worked at Beth Israel Deaconess for 30 years as an internist and their chief medical officer. Um, I currently work for an IT company called Arcadia. I also see patients at Care Dimensions Hospice in Lincoln on weekends, I'll be there this weekend. And I've talked to Ramadan about my hospice work and he's expressed interest in that. And I spoke to the folks at Care Dimensions, and they said they would be interested in speaking with him. No promises, but they would be interested in speaking with him. Um, my wife, Chrissy, is a registered nurse. She's a certified nurse midwife. Uh, we have four grown children, 20, ages 24, 26, 28, and 30. Um, Ramadan, if he's able to move in with us, he'll have his own room, his own bathroom, his own telephone. We have a nice, big old 125-year-old house in Newton. I work from home. My wife is at home every day. Two of our adult children are at home. Our dog's at home. It's a nice place. I think you will feel welcome. Um, 
I've talked with our neighbors in Newton Highlands, which is where we live, about the impending possibility of Ramadan moving in with us if he's granted parole, and they're pleased and excited um, that he would be part of our neighborhood. Um, we consider him a member of our family. We are ready to accept him into our family. Um, Attorney Teitelbaum asked me if we were intending to provide financial support for him, and I said, yes, we are. We can do that. Um, in fact, some of our uh, support, his supporters have already donated $2,400 for him, and I have an account for him, and that money is there. But we will support him financially until such time as he can find a job. I spoke to the folks at Whole Food Market in Newton Highlands. It's about a 10-minute walk from our house, and they said the same thing as Kira mentions. No promises, but we're happy to speak with someone who's an ex-convict, and yes, we will talk with him, and the possibility of work at the local Whole Foods is a possibility. Um, I've arranged his medical care with Dr. David August, uh, who's got a concierge practice in Chestnut Hill, and he said he would waive the concierge fee, which I appreciate. We arranged for mental health care with uh, uh, Dr. Bob Joseph, who's a psychiatrist in Newton. Um, our dear friends, Dr. Alan Abrams and Dr. Rich Balaban have said they will stand in if we need any help around the house should we be away and Ramadan needs something. Uh, we have some backup. So in summary, um, it is my sincere belief that he has paid his dues to society and he is ready to give back to society. Um, as I said at the beginning of my comments, there are no excuses. There is room for forgiveness. Thank you for giving him this opportunity. He and we will not let you down. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilor Devaney. Thank you for your testimony and thank you for the time we've talked a few times. And, um, I mean, I say this and I don't say it frivolously, but I mean it. If you looked up kind in the dictionary, there would be a picture of you and your wife. You are unbelievable. I've been here 23 years. I've never seen anyone come and offer what you're going to do for this man. And um, I think that's wonderful. And um, so um, what a wonderful future he will have to have a neighborhood that supports him and in a job out there. So um, I want to thank you for that. Uh, so you got involved, your mother-in-law, from your mother-in-law. So she got to know, I know, why don't you tell a story? Yeah, so briefly, uh, my wife's mother, Marjorie Stryker, uh, was working, volunteering with a program called Alternatives to Violence. And she met Ramadan in prison, and she felt that he was a man with a lot of promise. And um, he saw that she was a mentor with a lot of promise for him. So it was a good match. Um, and she was able to help him pull himself together and become a, a really good student and learn a lot about the world. So um, I thank my mother-in-law for well, making I, the Well, I want to follow connection. up on you on this is a side thing. Um, I did a little investigating, and there's a lot of inmates at Bridgewater who are very, very sick, some dying. You don't send them to Shattuck, you know? Uh, Liam Allen went to Shattuck. He didn't get the, the medical help that he needs, and I'm very concerned about that, and I don't know who to go to about it. So I hope that we can work together to see that there is some resolution for that because um, it, it, there is a need, and there is a need to have the proper um, uh, doctors and medication. And, you know, I'm not trying to be demeaning, but we know Shattuck Hospital, and we know the little that they have been providing. So um, I hope that, I'm saying it publicly now, so I hope that we can work on that and help those inmates that need the medical help that, that unfortunately, William didn't get, and, uh, um, and Ramadan didn't either. So um, I, I'm kind of talking, you know, on the side, but uh, that I hope we can do that. But again, thank you for, for what you're doing. Um, I know um, when I met with Ramadim, he, you know, he speaks so highly of you and your wife and your mother-in-law that you are family. And uh, I'll be looking forward to seeing um, where he's going. He's, you know, he's got the education. He's, he's gone through a lot of programs. So um, I know he'll, wherever he works, he'll, 
He'll do a great job. So thank you for all you're doing. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Very briefly, he's going to live with, with you. And who lives in that house? Uh, my wife, me, and our two older children, Julius and Isabel. Julius um, works for Riverside, caring for uh, folks with disabilities. And Isabel is a grad student at William James, getting her doctorate right, in psychology. It. Special very special person. Yes, sir. Very, very, very yes, compassionate sir. person. Yes, sir. You should be commended. Mm -hmm. Really, I, 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 words can't describe what I think of you and your family, what you uh, plan to do. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank very you. compelling. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Elaine Daniels. Um, good morning. And thank you for the to the advisor uh, advisory board for um, giving me this opportunity to talk about the man that I have known and loved for 52 years. Ramadan and I were were, were married. Um, well, we met back in 1969. We were just out of high school. We both worked at worked at the Boston Gas Company. I'm not going to go off my notes here because I know I only have a short period of time, and my notes might may carry me further on. Um, but we met in 1969, just out of high school. I was 18 and he was 19 years old. We've never lost our, our love for each other during the, the, the entire time that he's been incarcerated and before he was incarcerated. Um, we were married at one point and I became disillusioned after the Willie Horton situation, years after the Willie Horton situation. I lived here. I worked for the Department of Correction. I worked for the United States District Court. Um, I helped them move in that building that they are now on the waterfront from the post office square. Um, I, I have a lot of experience. Uh, I worked, as I said, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. I, I, did, um, I did legal aid work. I worked with the Legal Aid Society. So I, I understand the laws of Massachusetts and I understand what it takes for someone to survive well, once they've been released from prison. Um, I spent 48 furloughs with him. We never had one incident. Uh, there was never any drug use. There was never any alcoholic use. We attended church. I'm verifying just what he said earlier. We attended church at um, St. John Missionary Baptist Church, where I was a member at that time. Currently, I am living in the state of Florida. I'm a real estate agent. I hold several positions on different boards. I, I'm a, a secretary for Broward County Housing and Community Development Task Force. I'm also, um, I, I live in Castle Garden, which is a 55 plus community development a uh, uh, condo area, and I am the president of my building. Um, but I plan to move back to Flor uh, to Massachusetts. I don't know where I am in my Florida, Massachusetts, <laughs> 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 but I know by the weather. Um, <laughs> um, but I plan to come back to Massachusetts um, and do what I can. Uh, we plan to remarry because I got dis a disillusion after we had we did so many things. He has had to fight for everything that he's had. Uh, we, you asked about his um, his co-defendant, Raymond White. Well, Raymond White did something that Ramadan would not do. He was given he was given all these privileges, furlough release, work release, way before Ramadan was given these releases. Ramadan had to fight legally to obtain these privileges. Raymond White came out um, to work on work work furlough, and he went on escape. That's why he's not here now. He went on escape. He was out in Texas, and he started coming back to Massachusetts, and that's when he was arrested. I feel like Ramadan was the only. Out of, there was three people involved. I feel like out of the three, he's the only one that stood up like a man and took his punishment. And I think he should be commended to that because it, it, the other person turned state evidence, and Raymond White went on escape. Ramadan had 48 furloughs. He and I had 48 furloughs. He was also going out uh, in the community doing mentoring. He was out in the community cleaning cemeteries or whatever it took. He's a man that I've known all of my life. And I feel uh, that our relationship is so strong that if I had been here, I may have able, because I, I, I left him at that time because things were just crazy, Vietnam War and, and everything that was going on. I feel like when, he, when this incident happened, and I had been here, uh, it would not have happened. I feel that we we have that kind of influence on each other. Um, I plan to come back to Massachusetts. I've spoken with people today and in the past, even some of the people that are here, because I'm a paralegal as well. I went to Northeastern. 
Uh, and when he, when uh, when Will mentioned Northeastern University, I feel like there's a spirit there, because when I went to New, I attended New Northeastern University. I got my paralegal studies there. I don't even know if they have that course anymore. And he helped me do my schoolwork. I would send him my assignments in the mail, and he would do the schoolwork and send it back to me. And my study partner and I would go to the library, the Northeastern University Law Library, and we would trace down everything that he did, he, he had done for us so we wouldn't be stupid in class. Um, <laughs> this man has been better to me than, than, than men on the street. I have never in my life met a man with the tenacity and forgiveness and the heart that Ramadan has. This is all I have to say now. If you have any questions for me, I would be happy to entertain them. Council. Thank you, uh, Thank you. Councilor uh, Devaney. Um, your testimony is very meaningful. And I admire you for coming and, and speaking for Ramadan. Um, he spoke of you when we met. And, um, you know, when you think of that time, you, you were young. You were a young girl and married. And then he's drafted right away. And all of that that happened to him, the drugs and everything, you can understand your position at, at the time. So um, I, it, you really are uh, amazing to come. And I admire you and thank you for all you do as a paralegal. So um, I just want you to know your testimony means a lot to me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. We really appreciate it. Next, we'll hear from Chaplain Peggy Newman. Uh, she supervised Mr. Shabazz's participation in the companion program. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm quite well. Thank you. Very happy to be here today. And very happy to have this opportunity to speak on behalf of Ramadan. At first, I knew him only casually. He was a cadre at the state hospital who others looked up to, and I knew he was a man who took his faith seriously. But it wasn't until Ramadan became a companion that I came to know him well. The companion program was established as a volunteer commitment that required several hours of work one on one, as well as participation uh, in group activities and our weekly supervision group. And this was all in addition to his full-time work as a cadre. At first, we weren't sure how many people, how many men would volunteer to be in the program that took up so much of their time and energy. But Ramadan didn't hesitate. He was one of the first to apply. He completed the training program with flying colors. He easily mastered everything from the use of adaptive equipment to working with whoever we assigned him to. Um, as it happened, we needed a cadre companion who could work with an individual who most would consider difficult because of his violent outbursts, his speech impediment, which made him sometimes difficult to understand, and his cognitive deficits. We needed someone patient, compassionate, reliable, and sincere. Above all, the person would need wisdom and insight. And we found all of these attributes in Ramadan. It's not just a coincidence that Ramadan and Will Allen worked with two of our most difficult and challenging patients. These two men are cut from the same cloth. They're both exceptional people with great wisdom. They can sense what a person needs and find healthy ways of meeting those needs. By imagining what it would be would be like to walk in another man's shoes, they have a depth of understanding that many other people do not have. Something happens to men who serve as companions. In opening their hearts to another person in great need in an environment that often does not value openness, they have an opportunity to become their best selves. Ramadan was an extraordinary individual before he was a companion. But I think the program enabled him to deepen in empathy. And because cadre companions work together on many group projects, Ramadan was also able to benefit from the experiences working as a member of a team. Ramadan's many talents and skills transfer to the everyday things that happen in life. If granted his freedom, I'm certain that he will be an asset to his community. Anyone who comes to know him well will learn from him and I know he will not hesitate to help anyone in need. As you can see, Ramadan has many people ready to help him in any way they can. Second Chance Justice, which was the group that worked with Will, 
will be there for Ramadan, just as we have been there for Will. We would love to adopt Ramadan and bring him into our second chance justice family and the Parkers too. In closing, I'd like to say Ramadan is a man without pretense. What you see is what you get, a man with integrity and a good heart. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next, we'll hear from Carl Bowen, Institutional School Principal. That DLC. sounds scary, doesn't it? Institutional school principal. What's that? Uh, Ramadan. I forgot about the road race, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Carl Bowen. Well, welcome. Uh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. In Ramadan, welcome. So my name's Carl Bowen. I worked as a school principal in uh, the Massachusetts Department of Corrections for 34 years. I met Ramadan after the Willie Horton incident. Excuse me, before you, 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 you sure. even start, yep. I am because I've had some requests. For, we're going to take a five-minute break, okay, maybe a 10-minute break. People have to go to the uh, restrooms, and we'll, be, and we'll be back. But sorry to have interrupted you, okay? Thank you. All right.
in special ed, GED, life skill, and English as a second language. Don't know how good his Spanish is, but he was an English as a second language <laughs> tutor. And I look back, and just yesterday I recognize that often our tutors stay in one subject area. And I have a funny feeling Ramadan did that moving around or asked for transfers because he wanted to learn. He wanted to learn about special education. He wanted to learn if he lived in America with a second language. And I also recognize this great value in the classroom. I once had a brand new teacher who was trained to teach in public schools, not a prison. And this can be overwhelming for uh, a young teacher to come into the prison system. And she was going to be assigned a teacher's aide by the name of Ramadan Shabazz. And I, I knew she'd be in a much better position to develop her skills as a correctional educator because of him. And it came through today, and I actually wrote it down a week ago. His current abilities are going to make Massachusetts a better place. I see him working in a mental health facility with juveniles who may be in trouble with the law, in hospice. I can only imagine what he's going to, I want to hear from him the month after his release. Uh, he's a little overqualified for home foods, home, uh, uh, whole foods. But let me finish. He's truly a story of redemption. A man who entered prison at his lowest depths of his life and is worthy of this rare commutation. And I thank you for your time and Ramadan's consideration. Thank you very much. Any uh, quack, Councillor Joseph Ferreira? Thank you. Well, thanks for coming in. Um, I spent 30 years in law enforcement, but not in prison. So um, I don't know what an institutional school principal is. I, were you a, is we, that an... I was kind of a regional. I had all of Bridgewater and Plymouth, and we ran academic vocational school uh, programs ranging from special ed through high school equivalency. We had college. I supervised the Norfolk program when I worked over at Norfolk for years. I'm well aware of what BU does. Um, and I've been, I work at Massasoit now, working at Teach Government and Criminal Justice courses. Are you, we'll be or are you uh, part of the DOC? How did I was part work? of the DOC. Part of the DOC. Yes. Thank you. Did uh, Mr. K uh, Mr. Uh, Callis, was he, was he there at the time? Dan Callis? Yes, yeah, so sure, absolutely, yes. And Mr. Cowan, was he, was he there? Brad, yes, Brad Cowan. Cowan, yep, the big guy. Yep. Both, both Somerset guys, good yes. guys. Yes. Uh, I appreciate you coming in here because it is uh, still a mystery to me why these three came before us in the last like couple of months and, and not others. So I don't know how they select, but you said like he's the most deserving, but I don't know like the process. I know people can apply to the parole board and they get yes or no, but um, I'm not sure why these three especially got chosen. Yeah. Can you shed light on that? Yeah, probably their attorney. Their attorney? I would suspect. Yeah. <laughs> there you go, Mia. <laughs> no, I can't. I'm, I'm sorry. I can't shed any light on the process. How someone gets to this point, another man or another woman doesn't. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Rice. Councilor Marilyn Petito Devaney. Thank you for coming. Uh, You're your testimony means a lot. I, I just want to thank you for the work that you do. Um, that's very important. And um, for your interaction with uh, this nominee. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Last, uh, Councillor Paul de Paula. Um, thank you for being here. I just have a quick question. So, what age is being serviced in your 18 to 80? 18 to 80. Yeah. Okay. Roughly. Roughly, he was, a, he was, I truly mean that he was such a great role model and someone brought it up at, at one of the other things. So he is a role model for staff. It is a hard place to work prisons. Right. Old colony in 1988 in the early up through the early two thousands. Um, let me say this was real difficult because we were called a high medium, but that's only because Walpole grew tired of some folks and sent him down to Old Colony. And it was a hard place. And he was a great role model for staff also. When we talk about how positive Ramadan is, that is, that doesn't quite tell you the extent of the positivity he showed. You know, I, I truly believe that other staff believe because of him 
change can take place in inmates. Thank you very much. Before we leave, Councillor Mary Hurley, I believe. Uh, yes. Has, yes, Councillor Councillor Hurley, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, I just have a, a question of uh, this gentleman. Uh, being involved in the educational system, is it for a certain limited number of prisoners in one place, or is it a system that takes into account all of the different prisons in Massachusetts? Uh, Councilor, I'm, I'm retired, um, and I, I love my job, but I didn't like prisons anymore. Um, but I think I can answer your question. What, there's there's always waiting lists for programs, particularly the most valued college vocational training. Um, is that what you're asking? Are there are is there enough space for for inmates who want to become students? Uh, yes. To some extent, not always. Some of the waiting lists are pretty long. Probably even today, they were when I was there. All right. Um, Thank you very much for your service and uh, I just have uh, one comment or um, question for Ramadan, but my dog is going crazy right now and I got to put her out. So I'll be right back. All right, Maggie. All right. Thank you. Thank you. At this point, the uh, oh hearing is concluded. Uh, more likely than not, you never know Ramadan, but more likely. Uh, I would uh, believe that uh, the vote on your commutation will come tomorrow. Uh, I will recommend to the body, to, for whatever it's worth, that your sentence be commuted. You can count on me uh, for support. I wish you the best. And like I said to this other gentleman, Mr. Allen, don't let us down. Okay? Thank you. That will conclude oh, the hearing. Councilor Anello, I just wanted to say. Oh, to me, on... Yes, Councilor Hurley. Councilor Hurley. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to say to Ramadan that I am the same age as you are, and I can't imagine having the attitude that you have spending that amount of time in a correctional facility. I think your story is worthy of a yes vote, and I'll be voting for you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.